Hello, my name is Andrew Hall and I'm a professional wood turner from Weardale in County Durham. That's where I, I do my teaching and I also demonstrate throughout the country and Europe. I'm probably best known for making hats and I've demonstrated and taught how to make hats for around about the last 12 years. This is a, an elm hat and it's, a, it's probably my favourite hat. It's the one that I tend to take with us to most demonstrations and it's been sandblasted so it shows the grain really nicely. We've got some laburnum buttons with the texturing on the front as well. I'm also known for wearing dicky bow ties. This is a Coca-Cola dicky bow tie and I often turn the dicky bow ties as an exercise to warm up my hands. I believe strongly that we should do warm up exercises and a dicky bow tie taking into consideration the beads, coves and v-cuts is an ideal way to warm your hands up. But the other thing that I'm known for now and of, of late is really the musical instruments that I make on the lathe. I have a one here. This is a, a blues ball and it's a piece of tulip wood that's been turned on the lathe and the neck has been turned between centres and then cut down to form the neck. This one is actually a fretless one and it's tuned into an open G chord. But how it starts life is it starts with a block of wood, or a blank as we call it, that's held onto the lathe. Now the lathe that I'm working on today is a one that I've demonstrated on on a number of occasions. In fact, I've used this lathe, the Record Coronet Herald, at the last two Harrogate shows and at the Newark show. And since then, a number of my students who have seen it work and seen the benefits from the lathe have decided to purchase them themselves. So I'm delighted to have the opportunity to stand at the back of the lathe and talk to you about its different features but also to go to the front of the lathe and show you how the lathe works. And I'll talk you through some of the, the um, points that I think are very favourable if you're going to go into the market to get yourself a lathe of this quality. I think for the, the value for money it is certainly the best lathe in my opinion on the market. So we'll start off with a piece of tulip wood. It's been cut into a blank but I've turned, I've cut a hole with the sawtooth bit into the top and the bottom. It started off with two pieces, something similar to that. If you can imagine those two pieces clamped together and then the hole drilled into there and then the back's turned, we reverse it round and it's turned on so that it's hollowed out to create the chamber for the acoustics and this one has an acoustic hole in the bottom as well. And the wall thickness is a consistent 15 millimetres. So what we're going to do is we're going to put it onto the lathe and we're going to work on the lathe and show you how well the lathe turns. So what I'm going to do, I'm actually going to show you the points that I like about the lathe while I'm doing the turning and um, the benefits of this particular lathe. What we've got is a block of tulip wood and we're going to take the tulip wood, this is the, the, the thing that I'm known for, is the blues balls that I make. And we're going to turn the tulip wood to start with, we're going to turn the reverse of the, the ball, and then we're going to turn it around and we're going to turn the inside of the ball. So we'll go through the process on the lathe now, and then when it's finished I'll show you the process of how we do the neck, and we will end up with an instrument similar to this one, which is a blues ball, fretless, and a student would make one of these in two days on a course in my workshop. Okay, so we'll go on to the other side of the lathe, but before we go to the other side of the lathe, I need to talk about a student that works with me, very, very good friend. We've been working together now for 10 years. Harry had a car accident, and he is paralyzed on his right-hand side. And basically what happened was we set his lathe up and he had to work on the reverse side of the lathe, running everything in reverse, the chuck secured with the register, turning with his left hand, and also sitting in his wheelchair. So we had to have the level of the lathe at wheelchair height. Harry, I think he was probably one of the first people to buy one of these hurled lathes, and uh, since he's got it, his turning has transformed. He's gone from being able to turn balls and pens and platters to now being able to turn end grain projects such as goblets 
And the main reason he's been able to do it is because the head actually swivels around 360 degrees, travels the full length of the bed, and we can turn it around 270 degrees with the head down at this end, and he can now turn with his left hand on the correct side of the lathe. So what we're going to do is go onto the correct side of the lathe and show you some of the turning techniques and also show you some of the benefits of having a, a record coronet hurled lathe. Okay, so what we've got, we've got a, a bowl blank here, which is a tulip wood bowl blank, just under 300 millimetres in diameter. And the beauty of this lathe is it's, it's powerful enough to be able to work with a lump of material that size. The diameter, the maximum diameter you can get on there is around about 350 millimetres, so that's 14 inches. And the power of the motor is a one horse power motor, it's 700 and 50 watts. We can pop that onto here and I've got the 35 millimeter jaws so when they open up they open up to a 50 millimeter hole and there we can tighten that up into position and make sure it's tightened equally on each jaw or each nut and now we're ready to turn the material. So I've got the speed turned down to its lowest speed and the lowest speed with the second pulley, the pulley that's in the middle, is 140, the highest speed is 1800. I'm also going to bring up the tailstock and just allow that to support the material whilst it's revolving. Lock that into position, tighten it up, lock the quill and then position the tool rest six millimetres, quarter of an inch below the centre of the quill and about six millimetres, quarter of an inch to the closest point of the material, no more than that. And then you've got maximum support on the tool, minimum vibration. Check it's not catching and rotate it by hand. The tool I'm using is a half inch bowl gouge with a long swept back grind. All I'm going to do is throw up the surface of the material and then throw up the front of the material there. So I'm starting the lathe off, I've got good footwear on, I've got a smock on, I've got my eyes protected. At the moment I'm just turning. When I go into sanding, I protect my lungs with a mask. So we set it away on its slowest speed, build the speed up, and I'll take it, if I put the tool on here, and I put my hand on the, the, the actual tailstock, when I'm t turning the speed up, I can feel vibration. Now this particular lathe, it's made of cast iron. And cast iron lathes do take an awful lot of vibration. They're stronger and there we can see first level vibration there. That's round about 350 revs. I'm actually going to take it through that first level, level vibration. There. And if I take it right up, there's your second level there. You can see the actual tool shaking. Go back. And there we are. That's around about 520. That's a safe speed to start turning that. All I'm going to do is actually throw up the surface of the material. So I've got a good stance. I'm 600 mil between my feet, two foot. I've got my thumb on the top, my fingers underneath. I'm locking the tool into my side. And all I'm going to do is just glide across the top of the tool rest like this and take the high points off until I've got a clean surface. I'm laying the fibres down with the bevel and I'm just throwing up the surface. Now I'm going to stop about two thirds of the way along. And at the moment I've got thumb and fingers over the top there so it's an underhand grip. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to take it around to the side but because I've got a semicircle, I can break the end grain out on the semicircle. So I'm going to actually tool it from this direction. Throwing up the blank. So I get past the semicircle and blend that in. We stop it and have a look and see what the surface is like. There's a little bit of a flat there. 
a little bit of a flat there so we're almost at its full size so I can just touch the tool rest in a little bit to give us a little bit more support and then revolve it by hand make sure it's not catching anything set it away again and again you'll hear the audible sound the machine starts to rotate that audible sound is very very useful especially for two of my students who are registered blind not only can they feel the actual machine working but they can also hear the actual machine working as well they can also really hear from the revs the speed that it's running at although you you will agree that it is very very quiet it's as quiet as a sewing machine so again from this side pick the cut up underhand grip thumb support bevel contact the material and I'm just leaning across the tools locked into my side I'm leaning across I'm past that semicircle now and I'm just going to go around to this side thumb on here pick up the cut and just glide across tidying the surface up As you can see, this is dry wood. And with dry wood, that's a fairly hefty cut. We're getting a decent sized shaven. We're getting a decent sized shaven, and as you can see, the lathe isn't laboring at all. So I can knock it off now, and I can reverse. I can turn this tool rest to the side here, set it up there. So that again, it's about six millimeters, quarter of an inch below the center. Again, revolve it by hand, check it's not catching. And this time, instead of the underhand grip where you've got the thumb on the top and your fingers are underneath, I'm simply going to take my thumb down to the handle and put my hand over the top and I've got the overhand grip. The tool again will be locked into my side and I'm using the bottom third of the wing and I'm just going to draw it towards myself like that and just throw up the material. And I'm literally leaning in, locking the tool into my side, and drawing the tool out. And I'm just leaning back. Again, I've got good stance. And the lathe is just performing beautifully. And there. material is trailed up so again I can take the speed up a little bit more now that's just a rough cut still a little bit of low point there there's still a bit of bark but all I want to do is I want to curve this round I need to make a chucking point and in order to be able to do that what I need to do is measure the chucking point to 100 millimeters and it's going to be a spigot or a tenon rather than a recess or a dovetail so from the center to there we'll make it 50 millimeters make a mark and then we can just rotate the material just by hand there make that mark around there and then I can just position this so that this is 45 degrees and I can bring the tailstock back up Lock it into position, loosen quill, check, tight, tighten quill, rotate, safe to go. So now I'm just going to make a mark here, which is around about, actually that's the mark that I want. That was just a stroke of look really, rather than good management. That's the mark that I want there to show the straight side that will go to the curve. So I can set it away and just mark it while it's revolving and just put a mark onto there like that. And there's my 100 mil there. Now if you're new to turning, I find that the best way to actually create a nice curve in a ball is just, just give yourself some reference points on here. And now we've got what, one, two, three, four, five, six reference points. One, two, three, four, five, six reference points to there. 
and then we can work around. Now, for the sake of the cameras, what I'm going to do, I'm going to stand here and put my arm around like that. Normally, I would stand a little bit closer, but this is just to show you how to go from one line to the other. And I'm doing a push cut. There we are, just going round. Take the corner off and round to there. And just keep continuing, practicing that cut. Laying the fibres down. And as you get the material, as it's getting smaller, what's happening is it's actually get, creating a larger gap between the tool and the tool rest. Just move the tool and the tool rest in and away you go again. Now we might be able to turn the speed up a little bit more because it's in the balance. We're up to about a thousand revs there. So I can pick the cut up. Slide around. And as you can see, that's a reasonable cut. Now, another way you could do it is the overhand grip, and you could just use the wing of the tool, but look at that shaving that's being produced there. That's, that's a good shaving, and that's a sign of good torque. Now, we're, in, we're on the middle pulley, so you've got loads of torque, loads of speed and that's just rapidly removing the wood I'm holding the tool overhand grip if you can imagine that tool there on the front the pointing to 12 on the clock what I've done I've actually got it rounded around about 10 o'clock I've got it at an angle of about 45 degrees and I'm just drawing the tool round towards myself using the wing of the tool getting a nice shape onto there like that. Now I'm getting a gap here which is thicker than my finger which tells me it should be moved in closer to give you a better security on your tool so as it's not vibrating as much. Drawing it round and I'm getting that nice curve into there. What I want, I want a nice flowing curve round to here and this, this is really just your rough cut not the finished cut, it's, it's, it's just removing the material rapidly. To that point there. You can see I'm coming towards the, the chucking point there. So I'm starting to cut the chucking point at the same time, but I'm also getting towards that pencil line, which was me indicator. I'll move the tool rest in again and you'll notice I'm stopping the material from revolving whilst I'm moving the tool rest, it's always good practice to do that. And then we cut in again around about three millimetres, one eighth of an inch for the recess, or sorry I should say for the spigot. So there we've got almost to the spigot, an eighth of an inch and round. And you can see the shavings are coming off there nicely. So what I want to do now is I just want to crisp that up. And to do that I'll use a parting tool. So what we've got, we've got a 10 millimeter beading parting tool. It's ground to an angle of about six degrees which will reflect the actual dovetail on the jaws for the spigot. So again, set it away. I can leave the speed how it is. I don't need to keep turning it down and turning it up. It's running at about 960 and I can just push that into there square to the pencil line so that the material is square. So I've got a nice clean crisp junction where the jaws meet the material. Then what I'm going to do is I'm just going to finish this curve off from there. And again, I'm not going to go mad on trying to get a really good finish from the tool. This is the roofing cut. We will do a finishing cut, but with the finishing cut, you're better off 
taking it with a freshly ground gouge. So this is my roughing tool. It's not my roughing gouge though. The one thing you must never do, and again, it's a very important safety point. If I take this gouge here, this, this is called a spindle roughing gouge. Now that tool, again, is for roughing down spindles, but you would never use that on a ball blank. Purely and simply because it's a tang, and if you were to get a dig in, you could have a very, very nasty injury. So always a ball black gouge on a ball blank, never a spindle roughing gouge. So again, back to the tool. Draw that round. Blend that curve into that pencil line there, like that. You can see I'm not as aggressive with the cut now. Because the lathe has the power, I could take a fairly hefty cut off there to rapidly remove the wood. Now what I want to do is clean up that surface. So, so for that, what I've got is another swept back gouge. But can you see it's a smaller size diameter, it's 3 eighths or 10 mil rather than half inch, 12.5 mil. So I'm just going to clean that surface up nice and slow, slow the cut down, not quite as much of a shaving, draw that round to there, bring this tow rest round to the side, and again, there's a couple of little lines, we need to remove those. Blend that curve in nicely there. This is a freshly sharpened gouge. And then at this point, we'll just Tool up the edge, I'm going round to the side again, draw this across. And then this time thumb on the top, same cut but drawing it this way, so as we don't break out any of the grain on the semicircle. Blend the two in. And there, that's the tooling completed for the reverse side of the ball. Okay, so we've tooled up the surface of the material. We've used the half inch and the three eighths swept back ground gouge. Uh, a good tool kit to start with for any wood turner would be a couple of ball gouges, the skew, the parting tool, a spindle gouge and a spindle roughing gouge. Maybe a scraper as well and that would get you well started into doing your balls and your spindles. So I'm going to remount this eventually to finish it, to get the curve to flow into the bottom and remove the spigot using a set of button jaws. These are the button jaws that I would use. It's the SC4 chuck with the button jaws on. Very, very quick to change as you can see. I'm taking one off now. I'll put them onto the outside and then I'd remount the, the actual body of the ball on the outside to finish the bottom off. Okay, so what I've done, I've reversed the ball blank around. The ball blank that I first turned, this one here, was to give you an indication how to hold it on the centre. And the reason that I drilled that hole was purely and simply so that I could line that up through there. Another method you can use is your 150mm faceplate ring. Just make sure that the face plate ring is the same dimension from the edges so that you've got these two semicircles exactly in line for the neck. That's another method you could use and that's a method that I would choose either the, the hole or the face plate ring for this particular size of blank. We've got a blank of ash now and this ash blank has had a hole drilled in the bottom of it for acoustics and uh, I found out through a happy accident that um, a hole in the bottom of a bowl creates good acoustics and any turner who says that they've never gone through the bottom of the bowl 
is telling lies in my opinion. So, and it was as a result of a, a happy accident. I didn't mean to go through the bottom of the pool, but when I did, it turned the acoustics completely different. So what I've done is drilled a hole in the bottom here, so as we can turn it down to a finished wall thickness. So I'm gonna surface this up first. We'll see what it's like. It's running nice. It's up to speed now. It's running the same speed as it was before. And I've got an overhand grip, and all I'm going to do is just do a draw cut towards myself. This is a piece of ash. And in the good old sort of project prepared way, the reverse side for this was turned yesterday, so it must be pretty dry. Otherwise it would have distorted overnight. That's the other thing with making blues poles. You can't work with wet wood. When I make my hats, I want wet wood because I want the brims to bend up. There's the hat there, for example. The wood needs to be wet in order for the brim to be able to bend up. And the other consideration to make is when you're working with wet wood, protect your lathe. It's cast iron. Clean it down at the end of the turning and make sure that you put some form of silicon on just to keep everything running nice and smooth. It does run smooth, it locks nicely into place. There's the actual edge trued up with as large a diameter on the semicircle as I can get. So what I want to do now is measure into the wall 15 millimetres because that's the finished wall thickness, 15 millimetres there. So I'll just measure that in and There's our wall thickness there, 15 mil. I'll just run it round by hand because if I do it with it revolving, the pencil will drop into the half moon. And that's the other consideration you have to make when you're turning it, is that you don't put too much pressure on the first cut here, otherwise it might drop into the actual semicircle. So I'm going to give myself a reference point there using the parting tool. Overhand grip into there and there's a little V cut, a reference there that also if we do have problems and the tail sometimes skates back and again it does happen to everybody if it drops into that little groove it's going to stop it from tearing the edge out. So what I'll do now is I'll have the thumb on there and the hands underneath but working here yeah, I can, I can hollow it out working here. I probably would take the tailstock off when I'm working there. But again, one of the great things about the Herald is that we can swivel the headstock. Very, very quick to do. We take the lever, pop it into here, lift it up, swing it around, and there we've moved it 22 and a half degrees. But it's enough to be able to just get into the ball that little bit easier. But again, because it's cast iron, it's really stable. And we can bring the tail rest over to there. Again, get it as close as you can to the centre post. The centre post on this is one inch, 25 millimetres, so it's a good, strong central post. And then you've got less vibration with the tool held there because you've got the tool more or less over the centre here. So all I'm going to do is I'm going to put a series of V-cuts to start the cut in there. So there I'm in the centre there. I'll put a V-cut on there, and literally all I'm doing is, I'm just moving back. Keeping the tool in the same position, but I'm moving back. And once I know the tool's cutting correctly, it's a series of V-cuts. And again, physically move back. to there, and then I'll take some cuts out of the centre, and again, hollow out, and then another V-cut. So you're in the same position every time, but what you're doing is you're leaving a, an edge for the bevel to run through. As you can see, I'm taking fairly sizable cuts out of there, back to the centre. 
and soon you'll see a hole appear and that's because I drilled a hole in from the other side with the 50 millimeter Fossner bit there you are there's the center there now 50 millimeter Fossner bit is a bit like that and they are excellent bits to drill these holes but what you need to do is always make sure that the hole is drilled in a pillar drill if you use a hand drill it's very dangerous always a pillar drill pop that back into there and then we'll continue removing some more of the material now this is ash the other material I was using was tulip wood As you can see, I've got the tool close to my body. Because I can swing the head out, I can get at it much easier. It's much easier than leaning over the lathe to remove the material. So what I'm going to do now, I would go all the way down like that, and now I'm getting a little bit of vibration there because the tool is over this side of the tool rest. So what I'm going to do is move this out to here to give me greater support. So there you've got flexibility, you've got the versatility of being able to move it. Also, if you remove your head round 90 degrees, there is uh, an additional accessory that you can get which will extend the actual banjo so that you can have longer reach from the banjo as well. So right, I'm just going to pick up the cut here. And at this point, what I want to do, I want to cut that square there. So I need to be around at this position here to get a square edge on there. But don't forget, you've got a semicircle. So there's your bevel, that's your edge where you'll pick the cut up. Okay, so what we've done, we've turned the centre out and again for the sake of the camera I showed you the, the routine of taking the tool across, creating the V-cuts to stop any skate back and then I show you how we will create this rebate here which eventually would take a piece that will go over the top because we can either have a closed bowl or an open bowl like the example that we showed you. That will go into the acoustic hole there open up and there is a five millimeter gap between the jaws and the inside of the bowl which tells me that the bowl has a consistent 15 millimeter wall thickness through its diameter okay so that now would be ready for sanding so what I would do I would probably sand this using a rotary sander on a, a cordless drill an arbor sander um, alternatively you can sand it by hand but what you must make sure is that you use a block in conjunction with your abrasive because what we don't want when it's revolving is for the fingers to drop into this semicircle here so make sure it's either a block or a rotary sander again 75 millimeter one is probably the best choice and then we would sand it up and then finally to finish it off to remove the tenon what I want to do is pop on the button jaws with the SC4 chuck and show you how we would clean the bottom up because the bottom of this needs cleaning up and um, I'll show you how that's done when we do that. Okay so what we've done we've took the ball blank and we've actually hollowed out the center of the ball using the ball gouge again and I've taken it down to a consistent wall thickness of 15 millimeters. So now what we need to do there's the 15 millimeters there we need to actually reverse it round and finish the bottom just tidy the bottom up and to do that I'm going to use the button jaws. These are the button jaws that are on the SC4 chuck and the thing that you've got to bear in mind with these is that you've got to keep your speed. When we were turning we were turning at about a thousand revs 
So now that we want to finish the bottom off, we've got to turn at a slow speed, purely and simply because we're using the button jaws. So take the speed down to 600, and the beauty of the readout on the scale is that you can actually see that it's down to 600. That's another asset to this particular machine. I know I was, I was talking about Harry, my student before. He often uses that scale in order to be able to get the speed that he wants. So as he can preset it before he actually starts to turn. And, and it's very useful, especially when he's doing his pens with his acrylics and his hardwoods. So I can pop this onto here and we holding it on the inner jaw of the rebate that we've cut for the top and then I can just open that up onto the, the actual button jaws. What I do tend to do is make sure that the semicircle actually is in line with the centre of one of the jaw plates so that when we tighten it up again it's going to hold, you don't have to tighten these dead tight as long as it's tight enough to be able to secure it. Also make sure all of your spindle locking is off and that your head stocks tight in place. Again, you don't have to put an immense amount of pressure on, everything locks into place. So there we are, I'm checking that just to make sure that's rotating okay. And then I'll bring the tool rest up again. Again, set it so that the tool is more or less central to the, the pillar and then you've got your maximum support. For this I'm going to use the 3 8 ball gouge that we used before for the finish cut. It's a freshly ground gouge. Set that away. Check it's not catching. There we're on the 600mm and all I want to do is just tidy up the bottom of here. I've got about 2mm to play with. I'm just doing that very fine draw cut on there. You can see it's just slightly out. Again, it hasn't moved very much because this was cut the other day in preparation for today. But that should have cleaned up nicely and should be ready for sanding. The rest of it has been sanded. That's cleaned up nicely. That's ready for sanding. There's no torn grain on there, so that should do fine. So what we're going to do next is I'm going to straighten the head up. And, but before I straighten the head up, what I would like to show you is, again, how we can revolve this head around. We'll just loosen it on here. And this is ideal for anybody who's got dexterity problems, say they have right hand problems, or if they are left handed and they want to turn with the left hand, we can slide the head along to there, and we can swing it round to here. 270 degrees. There, it's locked into place. Lock it down. And then we can actually work on this side with it. Easy to work on this side, all we do is take off the tail stock. Bring the banjo around. Onto this end. There we've got the banjo positioned. Swivel the actual tool rest around and the beauty of this banjo as well is there's actually two positions where you can put the locking lever so you can just move the locking lever around 90 degrees or leave it where it's at it's fine where it is set it up and there for anybody who's got a, a problem for left-handed we can do it left-handed and we can work this way with the left hand and again Harry what he does he uses tools that are carbide cutters gets it under his arm, rests it onto here and he can work with it that way, with it revolving in the right direction. If you're going to work the opposite way, you make sure that on your SC4 chuck you use the register and you fix the stud down into the register. Okay, so what we've done, we've done the body of the blues pole, but what we need to do now is produce the neck. You can see how quickly it was for me to move the head and to be able to reverse it round to 270 degrees. I've swiveled it back round again to its, its standing position and I've locked it into position and um, I've brought this along just to double check the kiss joint and the kiss joint is absolutely spot on. If I show you with the, the lever, it's got a, an indexer on there so that when you actually move the head like that, it just slots back 
can you see bang straight back into place and it's absolutely in line with the actual revolving tailstock which is superb so now what I want to do is I want to make the neck and to make the neck what I'm going to do is use a piece of sycamore stock here and we want to produce a neck like that from a piece of square stock like that so I'll put it between centers and I find that the easiest way to actually put material between centers is either to finger gauge like that take the pencil to almost the center keep it in the same position swivel it around 90 degrees swivel around 90 degrees around there 90 degrees and there's the center of that piece of stock now if that piece of stock hasn't been planed square that's the easiest way to find your center this actually has been planed square so it makes it easier still so what we can do is just take a straight edge of some description the little ruler or you could just use your your gouge if you wanted to you don't have to have a straight edge in there hold the straight edge onto there corner to corner make a mark swing it around there again straight edge corner to corner make a mark and there's the center of my piece of material so now i'm going to mount it between centers and what comes as standard with the chuck is you get a four prong drive and you get a revolving tailstock center but don't be tempted to hit the four prong drive into the material using a ordinary hammer because if you do so you're going to mushroom the head use either a mallet and hold the material there or use a rubber hammer knock it into position so as it bites in the material could rubber hammer or mallet so as it bites into the material and then you can just pop the drive into the center there so as that holds into position just move your tailstock back just a little bit there we've got it locked on tight and as you can see this length of neck is 900 millimeters so there we've got the bed extension which gives us the 900 mil center if you're not using the bed extension you've got 500 mils between centers which is ideal for a little ukulele a ball-kalele as i call it which is tuned into a ukulele so there we are we tight into the drive there and what I'm going to do first of all is take my template I have a template for the neck I'm going to mark where the actual headstock is and I'm going to mark where the tailstock is there and then I'm going to take this down to its largest diameter the easiest way though to keep it square or if it's not slight, perfectly square is to give yourself a face side and face edge mark I served my time as a joiner and one of the first things I was taught by my apprentice master was to make a face side, face edge mark on the material and always use the stock of the square to the face side or face edge, mark it down there and then you've got a square mark around there and around here put it onto face side mark it on there I've also got a mark on here I want 10 millimeters on there onto here that's it there make sure every time it's on either a face side or a face edge and then when you do join your lines up again you'll find that they actually join up square there we are and then same on here and this is the point where we're going to go from a square pummel to a round pummel so it's the same process as if you were making a, a staircase spindle there we are so then what I'm going to do is again using my 3 8 foot background ball gouge I'm going to position my tool rest here so I've got maximum support over the tool where I'll go from the square to the round pummel but it's going to be an angled square to round pummel similar 
to the angle on there. So at the moment we're running at 600, I know for a fact that it'll not vibrate at 600. So I can start it there, let it get up to speed, and then I can turn the speed up. There we're up to 1200. Thumb on the top, fingers underneath, and then I'll just make a chiseling cut on here. Chiseling cut there with the ball gouge until it's into a full circle from the square, half a bead. Stop and have a look, it should be near a full circle there. About another mil and we'll be in a full circle. On to there. Stop and have a look. Yeah, we've got a full circle on there. Take it along to this end and do the same on that end. Again, position your toe rest so that you've got your tool held firmly there. And again, a chisel cut here. So we've got a full circle, then I'm going to bring it round and it's a bevel into there or a bead into there. Have a look, see if it's on a full circle. Just tighten up that tailstock. And then we'll continue till we get a full circle there. And then we know what we do when we turn the big rolling pin, really. There we are in full circle there. Bring that across here. And then we go on to our spindle roughing gouge. And this is where we'll rough it down with the spindle roughing gouge. I'm going to do a short section. And then we'll jump to the finished article. So thumb on the top there, fingers underneath. Bevel rubbing. There's the bevel rubbing there. Lift into the cut and just take the material out, chisel cut, and take the material down till you get to your full circle. Slow the cut down. Have a look and yeah, we're into our full circle fine there. So then it's a matter of chisel cuts. And then straight across, removing the high point. until it's a parallel cut there. Again, two cuts here. Now it's the easiest way where you're getting vibration off your tool rest. Take it down into the rough there. And what we'll do is we'll take it just beyond the length of the tool rest, so as I can then show you two methods of getting a nice smooth finish on the material. This is the ball part, so it's the widest point. widest point there 
and we should with a bit of luck be able to get that tool rest into that section here and lift that up six mil above the center of the quill check it's not catching and it's not and this time elevate the tool up and pick up the cut on the bevel there let it get up to speed bevel onto there and just glide across just the tool like that Make the material parallel and you're taking any of the little lines off the high points there and you're using that tool in the same way as you would use a skew. Now if you've got any movement at all you can support it with your hand there obviously watch you don't catch your hand on the square section and you can support it with the thumb. Pick the cut up and then so in that short section there, you'll be able to see a difference in the finish. And that's using the spindle roof and gouge to do that. So you're taking any of the high points off there. You can also get centre steadies. Or, once you've got your confidence, you can use a skew. It's got some lovely ripple in that sycamore there. You can use a skew. Take the skew using the bottom third of the skew and again pick the cut up there. Use the bottom third. Just square up to that corner and there you've got a much cleaner surface. There we've got a nice flow and shave and taking the high points off and a cleaner surface that way. And that's a smoother surface on there. So we've took the body surface down. Then what we would do is to use the parting tool. And if you can imagine there's your bottom there, there's your your bulk there. So we're going to take it down to a 38 millimeter cylinder there. So we'll take it from that section to there down to a 38 millimeter cylinder. If you find that you're getting oscillating, it's vibrating, put a center steady on, which is what most people would do, or make a steady. And then we've got the head stock at this end. There's plenty of stock here to make a, this is a three quarter neck to make a full size neck. So then we would saw it through the band saw and remove the material sand it round and then we take the, the balls, the two balls if I look at this one here for example and that would fit into there like that and I've got a one string diddly ball here this is a small one with a neck that's been sanded up and finished and that would fit into the ball like that And then this particular one over here is the finished article. It's got a little pickup on so it can be plugged into the amp. And uh, that's the acoustic sound. And that's more or less it. That's how I would make a blues ball. But the opportunity to be able to talk about the record lathe, it's very easy to talk about something that you like. And it's great that I get the opportunity to work with lathes. And the record coronet, I had a record coronet myself. I had a record coronet lathe years and years ago. It was a blue one. And I used it for many years. And then as you do, you replace your tools and your machines and your lathes and what have you. And when this one came back on the market, I thought, oh, that's brilliant. But what I really did like about it, first of all, and again, it was, it was as soon as I saw it, I liked the shape. I think the shape and the style is very nice. It's versatile for, I think it's around about the thousand pound mark. It's the best value lathe on the market, in my opinion. 
I'd like to thank Record for inviting us along to work on the lathe and also for all of the help and support that they give me when I'm doing shows because they're always kind enough to bring a lathe along for me to demonstrate on, which for a demonstrator is, is a great asset to be able to have a lathe to demonstrate on, especially when it's new as well. It, it makes it, the shows even more pleasurable. So thanks very much to Jonathan Craig and Record for the help and support.